Okay, so hello everyone and welcome, welcome to the Tornosol Talks. Uh, quick reminder, but so we organize these Tornosol Talks every two weeks, essentially on Tuesdays at 6.30 uh, Central East time. And uh, just a quick uh, announce before uh, starting. Uh, we are looking for next speakers. We have already like the next talks will uh, held on uh, like this March and April, we are okay, but we are looking for speakers from May and June. So if you are interested or if you know any people that maybe uh just let us know at anyone related to tournesol and uh, but so for today i'm very happy to welcome uh and introduce our speaker alexander samuel so alexander i guess you plan to present and introduce yourself so maybe i let you do it and uh, you have the floor uh curious to see what you have to tell us well thank you again so yeah i will present myself later on um so you know my name at least i'm alexander samuel and i did a presentation about uh something uh very personal because i went through a lot of things uh working on on scientific subjects and it's a question i'm asking myself sometimes whistleblower or red herring and um i realized being what i think a whistleblower but I could be a red herring, who knows. Uh, I just wanted to, to make a little presentation about how disinformation and conspiracy theories harm true public health alerts. So uh, there's a little clue at the bottom left of my presentation for those who recognize it, maybe if you go in demonstrations, but you'll know what it is later on. Um, so I hope it works. Yeah, it works. Do the slides uh, change? Because sometimes it's stuck. Yes, yes it's okay. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So uh, that's a, that's my background. So you know where I come from. Uh, in 2013, I did a PhD in brain development, molecular biology. So it's mainly molecular biology. I did some big data, bioinformatics and stuff like that, working on brain development at the University of Nice. Uh, I showed you one publication I made uh, during my PhD. But I decided to quit academic research. I was a bit upset with uh, scientific fraud and uh, the whole world of research, how it works, publish or perish and things like that. And I decided to, to try to find another way to still be passionate about science. So reading publications, even doing some science uh, with my computer with a low, low budget, like homemade science, but it's not very important. And um, I decided to become a high school teacher because I like I like teaching. I like uh, the interaction with pupils and students. And uh, well, while I was starting my career as a, as a high school teacher, um, I was I, I got some formations. We, we were taught how to teach, and one of the things that are taught in France is media education. It's by the CLEMI structure, a center for uh you know to to train people to train teachers in teaching how to relate to information networks and to media in general and um well i was always passionate about disinformation um because i'm i'm some sort of activist i've always been an activist and i was fighting far right networks early on and those far right networks often used disinformation so I thought I would fight it with science. And so I started reading papers about disinformation. And uh, those who were teaching us how to fight disinformation had read less papers than I did myself. So at the end of the talk, I went to the presentation and said, hey, uh, I read this paper and it was very enthusiastic and happy we, we were taught this. And the teacher the was an old, uh, uh, very smart person but she she told me well i'm a bit fed up with giving this these classes to teachers i don't know what to say and you seem passionate do you want to join it and i, I just said i'm i'm new i never taught teachers i'm just a new teacher but they decided to to make me a member of this uh structure and so i started working on this this formation in general uh it was back in 2018 and one year later I was already working on this disinformation topic with students and trying to, to develop new things. And some old friends of mine told me, hey, Alex, we don't see you in protests anymore. So can you please come back to, to some protests that are yellow vests in France? And I said, yeah, I read the media. There's a lot of fascists. 
I'm fighting far right movements. I don't want to go to to those protests. And they convinced me to to see with my own eyes because they told me the media is lying. So I said, okay, let's see. And I went there. And uh, of course, there it was a mixed movement. There were some far right people, but the people I saw were people I knew from before. Uh, here is one of the main activists I saw there. Uh, which is a, a left-wing uh, famous activist from Nice. But, uh, well, uh, just a few minutes later, it turned out that uh, the cops just stepped on her and she almost died and she was in coma for three days. Um, during that day, uh, the police also thought uh, that people, protesters were black blocks or dangerous people and those they started chasing everyone and putting everyone in in jail, actually, just uh, arbitrary detention, I would say. Well, they, they said uh, it was an illegal protest. Uh, it turned out it was legal. Uh, they said uh, they were dangerous people. It turned out it was sometimes uh, just tourists who were sent into jail for one day. It was just uh, one day custody just to check the background of the people. And so, um, well, it was my first experience with such kind of police brutality. So I was kind of shocked because for me, police officers were always uh, good people, good intentioned and uh, should be uh, very well trained. And um, I think there's a, something that also uh, triggers conspiracy belief among the protesters I, I saw. I was judging them a bit because everyone was saying, those protesters are all uh, conspirat have conspiratory belief. And, uh, well, if you treat them like that, well, there are publications showing that bullying uh, have a positive effect on uh, believing in conspiracy theories. Uh, precarity also uh, triggers conspiratory mentor mentality. So I think there were enough determinants pushing those people into conspiratory belief. And I don't think uh, the conspiracy theory was the main driver of the protest at the beginning, but it turned out it was used against them even more, which is a, a vicious circle, which is training them into being more and more conspiratory. Uh, one of the elements which was really uh, shocking to me was that um, when uh, people uh, filed complaints about these police brutalities that uh, happened these de this day. Uh, the official instances decided to investigate it. So they decided to choose the wife of the commissar who was in charge of security to investigate about this commissar. And a whistleblower, a police officer, uh, told it to the media only one year later and he lost his job, but the main commissar didn't. So I think all these elements are things that could help what happened next. What happened next was, well, I, I was in jail. Can I ask a quick question on the yeah? Yes. Uh, I would be curious. So, okay, it's uh, what you're saying is not very encouraging, but just like this research that you're uh, citing, like how do they quantify these, these aspects? Could you say a word about it? Oh, um, well, it's different research. Uh, the the uh, Jais gave a talk about about it, I think, recently. Um, it's mainly psychological studies uh, where they use questionnaires, uh, where they ask people um, about, they have parameters to, to evaluate uh, what happens. The left study, which I'm showing, is a bit out of context, to be honest. I, I, I decided to show it because I thought it was interesting, but it was bullying at, at workplace. So it was not really bullying in general. But um, they were uh, mainly using questionnaires and having different parameters, different items, which give a score of bullying, hypervigilance. And so it's, it's scoring. It's basically what, what's done in psychological studies. It's just scoring any, anything by asking with, question, with questions, questionnaires. Okay, thank you. So um, what happened then next in, in jail was that, uh, well, one of the Yellow Vests told me um, that President Macron is trying to kill us. 
all the yellow vests by hiding cyanide in tear gas. And so it was a real conspiracy theory, which was pretty strong. And I was like, what are you telling me? Um, once he could go out of jail, I found out how he came to believe that. So this happened, as, you, as I told you, in March 2019. Uh, two months earlier, what happened was that a, a famous politician, a left-wing politician from the opposition to Macron, uh, said that she had very strong health effects due to tear gas. And uh, she didn't mention Zyklon B, which is what the Nazis used against Jews in concentration camps. But the media uh, gave titles saying uh, a politician is claiming that Zyklon B is used in tear gas against uh, the Yellow Vests. So what she was saying was um, that her physician, her doctor, told her that she had the same symptoms as cyanide poisoning after being exposed to tear gas. And uh, he doesn't know what is exactly in this tear gas. And he wrote kind of a paper or something. And she was telling about it and saying, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm scared of this product, and was asking questions about it. And a police syndicate uh in france police syndicates are pretty aggressive sometimes it depends on the police syndicate some are more progressive but there are some which are famous for being very aggressive and not liking left-wing people and so one of those more aggressive police syndicates uh well made something which i call a strawman fallacy uh transforming this the symptoms look like cyanide poisoning into uh, it's the she claims that the state is using Zyklon B against the Yellow West, which is not what she said, and so um, this Truman fallacy also led to to some conspiratory belief among people, I think. But um, I first thought I it would be easy to to debunk, and so I just told them, well, if President Macron wants to kill you, he wouldn't use tear gas or hide cyanide into tear gas just to kill you. He, he could do it way more easily. I mean, we already have examples of uh, totalitarian movements uh, around the world where they just shot people. So why would he use some, something so twisted? And um, they were insisting, and I was thinking, okay, maybe they are scared for health effects in general. I will check out what, what we know about tear gas. So tear gas, uh, basically, you got two, two different kinds of tear gases. Uh, the most used in the world is called CS. The other one is called OC. Uh, OC is oleoresin capsicum, which is uh, pepper, which is present in pepper. Uh, that's why you often call it pepper spray, uh, chili peppers. Um, and uh, the other one is a very old one, CS, uh, which is easier to disperse. Uh, so usually when you have sprays, you use OC. It has a, a an orange color, and when you want when you have the grenades which do big smokes, uh, it's usually CS because uh, OC doesn't disperse as a big smoke. It's it's dif more difficult to disperse. Uh, other tear gases exist. Pava is a derivative from OC. CN is not in use anymore. It was uh, the ancestor of CS. And CR is not used very often because it's very, very irritant and uh, it's kind of dangerous. It burns the skin. So basically, when I'm looking at the formulas, there is no cyanide in OC. In CS, there are two CN groups. So as a molecular biologist and or as a chemist, you could say maybe there might be some CN, some cyanide, which is uh, which could be freed in, in certain blood circulation by the metabolism of this molecule, but I have no idea at, at, at this point, and I don't think it's enough to kill someone. And I started reading papers. When you go back to old papers, because we, we don't have toxicological data on, on new papers, uh, no experiments. We, we only have very old papers. Most of the experiments were done in secret military bases, Sadly, but we have some papers which made it into public domain and public publications. Uh, some others were released through freedom of act information, uh, which is a, a way to get access to secret documents in the USA when they are old enough or, or when there's a reason to get them. And so there are some publications I could find. 
Uh, this one, for instance, uh, just tried to inject CS, so this molecule, I will call it CS because it's easier to say than orthochlorobenzidine, malononitrile. So CS was injected in blood and dogs died. I found out this little concentration, I don't remember which one, high concentration. When they add uh, a sulfite, which is a cyanide anti antidote to, uh, to this injection, the dogs survived. So they said that uh, lethality uh, went through uh, cyanide poisoning. Um, there are also harder to find publications like, uh, well, this one is, is pretty easy to find. It's on PubMed. Uh, it's an association between exposure to orthochloric benzylidin melononitrile, which is a big molecule I, I am showing you, and uh, a metabolite, a urinary metabolite, uh, which is actually uh, the whole molecule without the malononitrile group. And you can see uh, a glycine added here. So a, a, small, a smaller group added. Uh, so globally, you have, if you find this in the urine, you probably have malononitrile somewhere in your body at some point. Um, and malononitrile, I found, I didn't find new publications, sadly. I just had to find very old publications, but it was tested and they, they wanted to check if malononitrile is degraded into cyanide. And this is the case, according to, to some old publications. Uh, malononitrile was uh, actually used in very, very old times. Uh, I don't remember the year of this publication uh, against uh, schizophrenic patients just to calm them. So it's crazy. They just injected. They wanted to inject them cyanide, actually, to 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 calm them down, and they were injecting at the same time cyanide antidotes, but they didn't want to inject pure pure cyanide. It was too dangerous. So they used malonitrile. Um, and this publication was the one I was thinking of before uh, earlier. It's uh, harder to find publication because it's uh, it's a military publication. Uh, it's from 2013, uh, where they directly quantified hydrogen cyanide generated at low temperature dispersal of the CS tear gas. So you have either metabolism in the body when, when the molecule is absorbed, or even direct injection of cyanide in the body. Uh, and going through publications, I've found some scientific misconduct and poor scientific quality work, like um, in India, Malotra and uh, Parvin Kumar, who published, uh, I put it in red on top left corner, a man exposed to atmospheric concentration of CS in range uh, from 0 0.02 to 6.4 milligrams per cubic meter, uh, did not have increased plasma or urinary thiocyanide, which is the derivative of cyanide, which shows you that you had cyanide in your in your blood or in your body. And they use a reference, 76, Jones, Nature, 1972. I thought I had the wrong Jones. I, I, I looked for all the Jones publications from 1972. It took me a whole month to, to, to find it. It was very difficult. But I found only this one talking about thiocyanide. And it said that uh, it, it resulted in a six to eight fold rise of the level in blood thiocyanate. So I don't get the misquoting here. Um, the other main publication, uh, which triggered the use, massive use of tear gas uh, everywhere without warnings, was uh, this publication by Ballantyne and Swanson, which said that. Uh, uh, they calculated the theoretical concentrations. They didn't measure anything. They just said that someone who is exposed to the maximal uh, concentration that, uh, that is tolerated usually, 10 milligrams per cubic meter, we will talk about it later, uh, and who stays there for 30 seconds, uh, would have the equivalent of the amount of cyanide in a 30 milliliter puff from a cigarette. But looking at the cigarettes they use, it's a publication from 1956 with cigarettes from the 1930s, 1940s, with very high cyanide concentrations compared to nowadays cigarettes. And that's the first fallacy because people are still saying it's less than a cigarette puff, but uh, it's not the same cigarette puff we're talking about. 
and we're not talking about the same levels of exposure nowadays because nowadays um, at protests uh, you don't stay only 30 seconds in a tear gas cloud so um, the situation was kind of like this one symptoms of tear gas exposure are similar to cyanide poisoning was claimed by a politician I was thinking that it would be interesting to check cyanide levels after tear gas exposure uh, because I think it was alarming. It could be something dangerous. Police told the media that uh, they believe that the protesters believe we are using Dyclon B against protesters, so it's it's just uh, nonsense. We shouldn't do anything. And uh, at the same time, there were protesters who were saying President Macron is trying to kill us all with cyanide hidden in tear gas. So it was a pretty difficult situation for me because I had uh, had to fight other other information networks which were claiming very strong statements which were shared very rapidly. When you say something very strong, people tend to share it way more than when you say something more moderate. But I managed to do some to alert a little bit to to do some to do some calls for people. I told them, please, can you check your thiocyanate levels after being exposed to tear gas? I would like to know if you have higher levels than usual because thiocyanate, as you can see on the left screen, I didn't, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the publication which I used. If you need the reference, I can find it again. Uh, so th there are the levels of thiocyanate after tear gas exposure and it goes down uh, days after after cyanide exposure. Here it's a direct cyanide exposure. I'm not talking about tear gas. It's a publication about cyanide injected and you can measure uh, urinary and blood thiocyanate level days after. So um, some yellow vests did this thiocyanate analysis and had levels which were way higher than the expected uh, values for a normal patient uh, for a smoker or a non-smoker, because smokers have a little bit higher values uh, because they are exposed to cyanide at low level. But we had two to three times more than the maximal level, which we, which is uh, stated in the in the analysis. So I thought maybe there is something. I'm not saying that there is a big issue right now with those results. I'm just saying I would like the authorities to check because now we have enough elements to say that there might be something dangerous. Um, media, the media started to talk about it, and they interviewed toxicologists. And toxicologists told to the media that since thiothyanate, as you can see, is present for days after exposure, it, it could be anything. It's not necessarily tear, tear gas. It can be anything that happened the days before uh, this uh, blood uptake. I agree with them. Uh, and they, they said, you should check cyanide levels. And I said, well, it's not my uh, work to, to check cyanide levels. You should do it. You're the, the poison center toxicologists. But uh, with such a statement, there's nothing to do. And nobody else would check it. So I started looking around Sadly, when you call labs and say, I want to know, uh, can, can you check cyanide levels? They all tell you, uh, you have to measure thiocyanate. And no, no lab, no single lab will tell you to measure how to measure cyanide levels. Cyanide has a very short half-life. It's present only a few minutes in the blood and it's metabolized into thiocyanide very, very quickly. So. Uh, if you measure cyanide, you have strong evidence that it's linked to something that happened 30 minutes or one hour before. So it would be a good measurement, but we don't know how to do it. Uh, well, I found a way to do it. I found a paper. I was very lucky. It was published December 2018, so a very recent paper, about um, a way to quantify cyanide in water and foodstuff, and it's also adapted for blood sampling and to measure it in blood. Uh, a startup did it, and so we decided to measure directly uh, cyanide levels in blood. Uh, the literature is a bit complicated or, uh, because uh, the cyanide levels, um, which are dangerous in blood, are not very well documented. 
cyanide basically blocks the respiratory chain. So if you are, if either you die or you survive, and if you survive, uh, usually it's metabolized so quickly that uh, it's, it's done after you, you don't have anything left. Uh, it can have consequences on, on your health. It can destroy some organs or affect some organs. But uh, when you survived, you don't see it straightforward that something happened. And um, usually people who have uh, received over 100 milligrams of cyanide die. We don't have many examples of people who have received more than 100 milligrams and who survived. So usually it's admitted that uh, 100 milligrams are enough to kill someone. Uh, for children, it's also already 50. According to the literature, it's not really discussed. I only found 100 milligrams. But an instant uh, blood measurement is in milligrams per liter of blood. And there uh, it was measured in fires. And they said that uh, in most publications, I read of I read of everything I could. If someone finds something else, I would be very open to to change my levels. Um, and they said that uh, usually over one milligram, uh, it's a danger, immediate danger to life. You can die. Uh, usually in fires, when there is a fire, people are exposed to cyanide. So in fire survivors, uh, cyanide levels were always below one milligram per liter. And in autopsies, when people died in fires, levels were over one milligram per liter. So they said that uh, when cyanide poisoning kills someone, it must be over one milligram per liter. And you have very strong health effects over 0 0.5 milligrams per liter. Um, that's also what, what I found in the literature. So these thresholds are not official thresholds. They are my thresholds from what I read in the literature. I'm open to discuss them. But what I found is uh, that um, using using this uh, quantifying method, which we can discuss also if some people are interested in molecular biology, uh, we had from 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 uh, milligrams per liter uh, in blood. So it was uh, we we didn't have many values. We didn't sample much because it was pretty difficult. Uh, but we did it in protests, during the protests, amid black blocks with uh, volunteers who wanted to know if there was cyanide in their blood after exposure to tear gas. Um, during all this time, I had a lot of issues, a lot of difficulties. The first one was a media campaign, let's say, against me. I'm, I don't want to sound like a conspiracist, but what happened is that some people, uh, protesters, uh, believed that we were uh, members of the government trying to to take up their DNA and that we were fake protesters and that we were not really doing something about tear gas. And so they alerted the press. Some people say, uh, said that we it should be forbidden to take up blood in demonstrations. It was a discussion. Uh, and uh, the media actually uh, believed and uh, let... Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, some someone very weird. Uh, be the main interviewed person there. Uh, she's an astrologist, uh, telling you the future. I don't know how, how you say the, the people who, who know the future and tell you the future. She's doing cabalistic and stuff like that, and uh, she's a yellow vest protester, a very important one. And she she told the media that uh, we are doing illegal stuff, and they interviewed her. And sadly, it was on AFP, Agence France Presse, which is not only not a single journal, but it's a media agency. And so it got copied all around the French media. There are all, all news, French newspapers copied the main message telling people not to, to take up blood, not to accept it, and that it's dangerous, that these people are, are crazy. Um... My position as a media educator got lost uh, early on, on March 2019, when I was sent into custody uh, during uh, this first protest. Uh, when I came out, uh, they, the media called me because I was witness of how this old lady got uh, was in coma and got attacked by the police. And I filmed how the commissar, the, main, the chief of the police, 
uh, impeached medics to help her. He didn't let uh, doctors and medics go to this lady who was uh, losing her blood. And I filmed this situation and uh, I sent it to the media and the media lost my phone. They called the Klimi back because they knew that the, I was working at the Klimi and said, we want to talk to Alex again. Can you give me his number? And uh, this was the worst thing to do from the media because just after that, the Klimi called me and told me that uh, they didn't want to work with me anymore. They don't want bad reputation, publicity and stuff like that. And so I lost this position. And just after that, it was, it got even worse because uh, the Paris prosecutor's office decided to open a case about violent aggression because taking up blood of people is a violent aggression. Uh, they were considering that uh, the physicians were not physicians, uh, despite they were true physicians and were uh, actually registered to the French order of, of physicians and everything was right. Uh, they even asked the order of the French physicians if they could do it, and they told them they could. Uh, the case was opened. We went to Paris to get investigated. We had to pay a lawyer. It was pretty expensive. But in the end, it turned out that uh, they didn't want to, the, the, the investigators said they didn't want to sue us. But the prosecutor's office decided to sue us anyways, and they requalified it into a research without asking ethics agreement, uh, which we got. We won the case in first instance because we didn't we didn't consider we were doing research, um, and uh, they appealed. So we will see what happens in the in the follow up. Um, and I got also, after the first arbitrary detention, two other weird detentions. Uh, one of them was not at a protest. Uh, I was just walking in the streets in the center of Nice. And police officers took me, put me in custody. Uh, two days of custody. Uh, they took my books. They, they investigated a case. They wanted to know if I was the one who was throwing paint on banks because there were protesters who were throwing paint, uh, black paint on banks to, to protest against uh, uh, pollution or banks investing in, in polluting industries. And so they they decided to, to investigate if I was the, the person doing it. And to investigate this, they had to take evidence at my home. So they went to my place. It took me 48 hours, so two days in custody, went to my place, searched my home, and found books about tear gas, which were very good clues to know if I was throwing paint at banks. And so they took all the books about tear gas, uh, and uh, they took also my computer and everything. And uh, after two days, they just left me out of jail and said, yeah, we're sorry, it was a, it was a mistake. It wasn't you. Um, so while doing this, as you can see, I had a lot of uh, problems, issues, and uh, enemies, let's say. Um, and uh, when the media was in interviewing toxicologists, saying that people should not do uh, blood analysis, people should not check their cyanide levels and stuff like that, uh, I, I thought I was kind of blocked, and I tried to find a way to 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 tell protesters or to, to tell people in general exposed to tear gas. Uh, it would be interesting to know, anyways, even if the media is telling you not to know, not to do any any analysis. I think it's important to know if you have high levels of cyanide in your blood. And the only ones who accepted me were actually conspiracy theorists networks. So um, I decided to just contact main yellow vests, the famous ones, and told them, "Hey, uh, the media is telling this." I think there's an issue anyways. Uh, could you please tell people just to do analysis and tell us if there is something? And so as you can see on this picture, it was not always very funny because there were some weird people with masks and stuff and saying a lot of conspiracy things around. And I was in the middle of this trying to tell people to do some blood analysis. Um, but they had hundreds of thousands of views. So it was a way to to tell people to to check it at least. Um, 
another famous conspiracy theorist who later on uh, become uh, became uh, someone telling that uh, President Macron would fall because he has secret documents he will show to everyone. So it's a very strong conspiracist. Um, knew of our work and asked for asked us if if we could take up his blood and check his cyanide levels. And we did it, and we thought it would be useful because he had 500,000 followers at that time. So we were pretty happy that 500,000 people could see this result, which he posted himself on his uh, on his Facebook page. Um, another conspiracist, uh, Juan Branco, he wasn't that conspiracist. It's difficult to say. He was also the lawyer of the left-wing uh, leader. But she turned out to be very conspirationist lately. Uh, he he's a lawyer, and he heard about my third arbitrary detention. He found a way to contact me, and he told me uh, he would protect me. And actually, it worked. He made a video about me saying that they arrested me. And just after that, I got uh, strong media attention with a lot of journalists deciding to investigate what I was doing and to to check to ask other scientists and to get uh, some more serious work I will tell you about it later and um, I also tried to do some prevention and public information and uh, I report another conspiracist who was anti-mask anti-vax and everything during the pandemic but at that time back in 2019 he was already claiming that uh, government was hiding uh, dead yellow vests which were killed in protests and stuff like that but he had also hundreds of thousands of views and this um, he accepted to invite me one day where I could uh, do some prevention about uh, telling people not to expose themselves to tear gas too for a too long period of time uh, wear glasses wear to, to protect the eyes um, talk about respiratory protection because the respiratory ways are, are attacked and stuff like that and to tell them that there is also maybe some toxicological problems so to wash their clothes when they go home and not to to keep the uh, tear gas on the clothes which is uh, often the case in protesters um so in the middle of a uh, whole uh, buzz of different claims in the media about the blood uptake about uh, people claiming that there were new tear gases, that it was mustard gas. Uh, they were using nerve agents even. All this was, was going on around me. Um, and I was just saying, I think there is enough cyanide in blood after tear gas. We showed it, we know it now. Um, does it have epidemiological consequences? It would be interesting if the authorities could check, if investigate it. With serious means I, I can do it i'm just a, a random guy I'm trying to with a scientific background i think there is an issue it would be interesting to do it but this message couldn't go through with all this buzz around it all the these words um interestingly about mustard gas it's a very psychological weapon um because it's it killed less people than uh, bayonets the knives at the end of the the fire guns in World War One, uh, and it scares people. But actually, this tear gas, CS tear gas, is more irritant than mustard gas at the same concentration. Luckily, it's not used at the same concentration as World War One during protests. But uh, it's interesting because it's an even higher irritant than mustard gas. So if people knew that exactly, maybe they could make up even worse the theories about uh, what's happening with uh, with our government, which is trying to kill us all. Um, I read a very interesting book which inspired this slide. I think uh, it's just an opinion. It's not really something I demonstrated, but I think it it was at stake. And it would be curious if some people want to to check it out. Uh, Stefanie Lukasik wrote about uh, influence of opinion leaders, um, and she was claiming that uh, it's multi-staged. Uh, when you get an information from a media, from, from an influencer or something, you don't get it directly. You often got it because a friend of you shared it, or you, you got it through sharing through social networks. And so 
the whistleblower is one of the main sources, can be in a media article or somewhere else. And there are other uh, informants, red herrings, which are giving information out. And opinion leaders can be very small opinion leaders. They can be leaders on only two or three persons. It's not big opinion leaders. They only have a small network following them. Uh, will share the content and say something. Those who share the whistleblower's content will help the actual alert about public health. But those who share a mixed whistleblower and red herring contents uh, might trigger what I would call a flawed alert, a mixture of something serious and something weird, which would uh, actually disencourage people in investigating it. And someone sharing only the red herring, which is often more vocal and more impressive, will only trigger red herrings. So this slide is a kind of a makeup of it, but you can imagine now a situation where you have one whistleblower giving content out and thousands of red herrings around. And this is kind of the situation I thought I was in with another distraction, which was uh, um, the police information, which was trying to influence politically and other networks, of course. And so I think it was a very difficult situation for our whistleblower. So um, I decided to ask backup first in the scientific community. I wrote to scientists spe specialized in this uh, topic. I contacted them, uh, mainly those who were interviewed in the media, toxicologists and people like this, but also those who published about tear gas. And uh, some, uh, some of them do not appear anywhere because they told me they don't want to speak out or they don't want to say anything. I, will, I won't tell you who said what to protect them a bit, but I will tell you that, um, I will quote one message, I don't have the latitude to talk about it publicly. So it is some, some kind of messages I received. But they all, all of these people confirmed that my work, I, I wrote uh, something about this case, what I'm telling you, uh, a little report with bibliography and stuff like that. And they all told me that it was pretty sound. Um, it was sound enough for uh, one of them who, who died recently, André Picot, uh, who was the leader of the French Association de Toxicologie Chimie de Paris, which is a French association of toxicology and chemistry in Paris. Uh, he was uh, he's pretty respected. He has, he has a good resume. And he was telling the media that I was... Um, uh, over-interpreting results about tear gas, that uh, what happens in this dog experiment I showed you wasn't sure to happen in uh, in humans. It works on animal models, but who tells you that you have cyanide in humans? And so I did, I called him, I told him all the, the elements I told you here in this presentation, and he got convinced that uh, in humans also it's metabolized into cyanide. And he even thought it would be interesting to make an alert. And so his association decided to publish a whole uh, document. I'm the first author, he, he was the last author, uh, to publish a whole uh, alert document of 150 pages with a big literature review and some of the elements I showed you. Another important person was Steve Wright. He also died um, from Omega Research Foundation. He put me in touch with uh, main scientists and he gave me some um, some, some advices uh, to, to be a good whistleblower. And uh, Dan Cazetta, he's a C CBRN specialist, so chemical, biological, radiolog radiological and nuclear specialist, so the risks. Uh, he was working at the White House. He was he's a member of Bellingcat. I will talk to you about it later. It's uh, he was very important about Bashar al-Assad use of uh, chemical weapons against population, and he also decided to to take some of my work uh, and to use it, and he proposed me to be the translator of his book. Um, the other ones who were very important to make uh, to, to be a whistleblower to me were journalists. So I'm showing you a lot of them. Um, the main one was Emmanuel Anison. Uh, while in March 2019 uh, and Ju until July 2019, I had this um, media agency agency defamation against me. She contacted me. She was the only journalist who contacted me at that time. 
And she looked at the at the case. She, she told me, tell me what you're doing and explain it to me. And when she, she noted that the other journalists were just going very fast and publishing stuff without checking, she took her time. And, sh and so she published only in July 2019 a four-page document in French most-read weekly magazine, L'Obs. Uh, uh, actually kind of to help me but she, she wanted to to put things straight about what I was doing uh, so after a time from March to July where media was saying we don't even know if the those who take up blood are physicians they took blood took up blood clandestinely I have uh, media occurrences where you see the speaker saying this which is not the case uh, there were more detailed investigations which uh, were published in end of July beginning of August 2019 and I got three more attention uh, from September to March 2020 where uh, even the New York Times or L'Humanité, Le Figaro which are more serious media in India also uh, more militant one feminist media decided to investigate this, asked me questions, looked at it, asked other scientists and made very, very good work. I'm very happy with uh, Pierre Roper's work from Transculture, who summed up my work better than I could do it myself. So most of them spent uh, at least uh, 10 hours with me on the phone. Some of them took uh, five or six days uh, calling me every day for five or six hours and then investigated other cases. So it was a lot of time of, of work to, to get this published, which explains why, why it took so, so long to, to be published um, if, after this uh, first campaign. Um, and in July 2020, I managed to publish a report on this tear gas toxicity with André Picot. And this was also covered by some media. Uh, sadly, what happened is it was 2020, we already had COVID, and so it was published in LOPS because this is Emmanuel Anison, the journalist who helped me. I wanted to thank her. I told her when we will publish this report, you will be the first one to know, and uh, she was the first to publish it. My, uh, my whistleblower thing about tear gas was the second most read article during a few weeks was this the, this one on the right about uh, Professor Christian Perron, who was claiming that uh, pharma industry uh, was the first source of corruption in the world. He's an anti-vaxxer. He was promoting hydroxychloroquine. And uh, it's a very interesting case. So I will show you a little publication about it um, because so I, I made up this figure very quickly just to, to show the, the numbers because it was a, a text. It was written in a text format just so you see, see the numbers. Um, so this whistleblower, as they called him, uh, I call him a red herring, uh, was uh, claiming that when you have Lyme disease, uh, it can be a chronic Lyme disease, which is the case. Uh, so Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria, uh, Borrelios. Borrelia is the name of the clade of the bacteria. And uh, he was kind of using this. Uh, he was um, he had patients suffering from, uh, uh, they were tired, they had headaches and different symptoms. Uh, so he told them, you have Lyme disease. Uh, patients said, okay, well, finally I found a doctor who tells me what I have. What can I do? So usually you take antibiotics against uh, bacteria, but first you have to test if you have this bacteria in your body. So he tested it. Result came back negative. And of course, Perron said it's because the Nazis uh, made some secret experiments on Lyme disease, on Borrelia, and created an undetectable uh, bacteria, which no PCR can, can detect. And so you have this secret Lyme disease and you should take antibiotics anyways. I will cure you. I will save you. <laughs> and he even writes books where he claimed that people uh, who couldn't walk anymore after taking his antibiotics could finally ski again. So it's not walking on water, but it's skiing. It changed a bit. But yeah, uh, it's um, uh, very weird claims. And he got very strong media attention 
from newspapers and from television. He alone had appeared in 20, almost 25% of all the newspaper publications and 45% of all television shows talking about Lyme disease. All the other scientists specialized in official in, in this topic, uh, which were uh, following the official guidelines, were featured in less often altogether. So it's impressive to, to see how a uh, red herring or a fake whistleblower can get very strong media attention. Uh, this paper is very interesting about it. Uh, so I close this little parenthesis to show you how whistleblowers can also be uh, cut out by, by, by disinformation, by red herrings. Um, so what I also worked with is NGOs. Um, there's one which is called Bellingcat, which is very important because they work on on yeah on, on war scenes and on very important topics. Uh, Dan Cazetta wanted to make a, a little work about tear gas during the Hong Kong protests back in 2020, and he asked me for some information, and I I had contacts in Hong Kong protesters, and I managed to to give him the information he needed, mainly dispersal temperature of tear gas. So they measured it with uh, different uh, markers. And he published a little work on Bellingcat. I also worked with Forensic Architecture, which is a very interesting NGO. I recommend it to people who don't know it yet. Um, it's architects who make 3D models to investigate um, general cases, uh, like explosions and stuff like this. Here in this case, they use uh, physics particles uh, so physics in general science, to um, make models of uh, aerosol dispersal. And so they, they compare these models to the actual images of tear gas dispersal. And they managed to make some models that matched the exact dispersal we can see on the videos. And so they managed to, to evaluate the concentrations with a high error, but uh, it was, it's not very precise. But they used these physics to evaluate how much tear gas is in the air. And I told you the concentration, if you remember well, I think you forgot it, but I will tell it again, of 10 milligrams per cubic meter, which is the maximal concentration one can endure, according to Ballantyne in the old studies. Uh, we went up to way, way, way more. We went up to, uh, to 60 to 80 times more. And uh, we even had uh, some, so, so it, it was really crazy. The, the concentrations were but very, very high. Uh, old publications even said that when you are directly at the place where a tear gas grenade explodes, it can go up to five grams, 5,000 milligrams per cubic meter during a very short period of time, but disperses very quickly. So you don't know how long it stays at that concentration. It will disperse and then reduce the concentration at a single point. And the last uh, NGO I worked with uh, was Index. I was one of the founders of this NGO. Uh, it's, uh, it's, again, an NGO which is using video and open source intelligence to investigate uh, police violence cases. And then I helped on the investigation about Steve Mayakaniso, which is a young man who died during a party, a music festival. Uh, in Nantes, in France, back in 2019, uh, in an intervention where the police used 33 tear gas grenades in less than 20 minutes. So uh, the level of exposure could be very high in such a, in such a context. Um, I also turn to some politics. I, I think it's it might be b badly seen because politics are it's always very partial and science and politics don't mix well. But I think politics should use sound science to claim things and to 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 give their arguments. And many politics politicians don't uh, don't use sound science. Uh, we can see it with uh, GMOs, for instance. Um, well, uh, here we have uh, some of the actions I could do with political actors. First, it's not really political. It's, we have an instance in France for public health alerts. I sent a whole file to CNDASP, who accepted it. 
So this this was pretty pretty good. They then uh, asked the Minister of Health to answer, and we are still waiting for an answer. It's been three years now. Um, Sébastien Nadeau is a French deputy from from Macron's ma majority, so he's not an opponent at the beginning, but he was um, he left the majority because he was uh, uh, protesting against. Uh, Wep weapon sales in Yemen by French uh, by French companies, and uh, so he was he's uh, he's against weapon sales and against weapons in general, especially in war. And so the topic of tear gas, which is not a war weapon, but which is a civil riot control agent weapon, chemical weapon, uh, he was pretty interested in it. He accepted even to write an introduction to my to my document. I thought it was interesting to have politicians take it and look at it and read it and she asked a question to the french government uh he also asked one, one question sadly we had an answer um which claimed well i won't go into detail uh, they obviously didn't read the the alert documents because they claimed that it was lacking some informations which were actually written in the table of contents so if you want more details, I can discuss it, but it would be too long. Uh, I also worked with uh, a university uh, and media collective project in South America, El Negocio de la Represión, which was a, a group of uh, journalists and scientists who decided to make a big website about uh, weapons used by police in general. Um, I was their expert on tear gas. And so they made some videos and some very good information for the public. I worked with um, two uh, specialists who are, who are from the police, Daniel Soto in Chile, who was uh, actually, he's a lawyer. He's also a human rights instructor for police officers in Chile. And Daniel Gomez Tagl, who is uh, the same human rights instructor in Mexico. And both of them were very interested in my work. And we're convinced tear gas is dangerous and is used way too frequently. And they wanted to change mentalities among the police. Uh, and finally, I worked, I was commissioned by the National Institute of Human Rights of Chile, uh, who asked me to also write uh, a big review document about tear gas. Um, I also published a few things. So I mentioned the big one in the center, which is my, uh, in French, a uh, big document, 150 pages with a literature review. I, I basically, I did more than during my PhD. I had more passion in this one than in my PhD. I'm a bit ashamed of it, but it's like that. And so I read basically every single paper mentioning tear gas. I'm lucky because literature is not so big about it. And uh, I didn't do that with my PhD, my actual PhD. I didn't read every paper working on the uh, transcription factor I was working on. I'm a, and yeah, it, it changed my way of doing science because I found a lot of scientific misconducts or the claims I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, and I also noticed that the global scientific consensus is saying this weapon is dangerous. It's not very proportional. It's, it shouldn't be used that much in protests. Um, I didn't find any scientific publication that claimed that it was uh, useful or it should be used most but it, it could be a bias maybe those who are interested in it are also people like me who are a bit shocked by it uh dan casetta asked me to translate his work on neurotoxic agents and he let me write an introduction of the book where i could talk about tear gas and uh daniel soto the human rights instructor in chile uh, let me write a chapter in Spanish in his last book uh, about uh, the theory and practice of uh, use of force and the international laws uh, that uh, cover use of force in protest situations. So to sum up all that happened to me, I did something very unscientific. I'm very sorry. I have I have no idea how I could uh, really do something else, something measurable or serious. 
But I just wanted to to give you a feeling of what I had, and I think it could be interesting for people who are working on this information. Um, I decided to ask on for, for various things to to try to be a whistleblower, and I noticed that scientific community support was weak, but was there with me. Uh, when I when I see red herrings or people claiming very weird stuff like uh, the government is using. Um, neurotoxic agents against the population stuff like that you have no support and even uh, the scientific community is uh, st saying it's false so it's pretty good to, to know that uh, there is an integrity among the scientific community which is pretty i'm pretty happy of it even though scientific publications are sometimes not so good uh, media attention was uh, all right but there's way more attention to red herrings. Politician support well, was also or fine. I had some politicians interested in it who took the time to look at it, but most prefer taking time on red herrings. Uh, and conspiratory network support was also acting kind of the same. So I think it's it's a common feature. You have the attention depending on the strength of your claim. That's a feeling I got. I think it could be interesting to to check maybe to to score the strength of a claim and to to check how much media attention you get on each claim. I don't I'm not aware of any publication in that area, but it could be something to 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 go to go for. Uh, what was interesting for me was that uh, non-governmental organizations had a very strong support for me. They, they spent a lot of time on on looking at what I'm doing and they are actually the the main actor who was uh, involved in checking my stuff and working with me and asking questions and stuff like that. So I'm really happy of that. Um, during the pandemic, I was in touch with Hong Kong. I was in touch with uh, people, protesters in Hong Kong who were exposed to tear gas. And they told me, uh, so I rephrased it a bit, um, that the defiant population will not trust the authorities in the case of a serious crisis. When they told me this before it actually happened, while sending me articles about the Chinese whistleblowers, uh, journalists or uh, first physicians, uh, who were saying that it was a, the pandemic was coming and who were silenced by the Chinese government. They told me that profiteers, manipulators, gurus, uh, come to fill the av available space for people who distrust authorities. And they told me that I have some sort of legitimacy among the Yellow Vests with my actions about tear gas. Uh, and told me I could be important. It's, I'm not a hero saving all the lives, of course. I uh, have to a modest contribution to saving lives. But it could be important to to help this population, which is already defiant for the virus reason I already showed you, uh, not to fall in conspiracy theories or uh, and get vaccinated and get protected and uh, trust masks and trust uh, social distancing and stuff like this. So I spent a lot of time going to the conspiratory networks which invited me about tear gas and talking about uh, the pandemic, trying to give a normal, uh, strong scientific message about uh, social distancing, confining vaccines and stuff like that uh it turned out it where well, it worked pretty well because i was invited by uh russian disinformation campaigns uh, like sputnik news and rt i was even invited to debate against christian perron i was very happy to have it in front of me and confront him with all the harm he does to the population uh, I was invited in most conspiratory groups. It was pretty interesting because um, this made me... Uh, they, they liked me, actually. They, they liked the way I was talking. They, went, they did not agree with me because they wanted their conspiracy theory to be to stay on top. But it was... Uh, I was often received very, 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 very friendly way. And the most interesting thing is, to me, that at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, what was dysfunctioning was uh, the official institute in France, the IHU uh, Méditerranée, with Didier Raoult, 
who was the actually the main scientist in that field in France, the most publishing one, and he had the biggest institute on infectious diseases in France. And so all the media uh, invited him, and there was not they, they were claiming that maybe his research was not that sound or there might be some issues, but nobody was saying it was scientific fraud. And uh, despite the fact that uh, um, people like Elizabeth Bick or uh, Leonid Schneider from For Better Science, which I recommend, were already publishing elements that showed that uh, the data in the first publication of, about hydroxychloroquine are not sound and cannot be trusted. And, well, I was invited in VQ, which is one of the most conspiratory uh, media in France at that time. And uh, they were very interested in the fact that I was uh, showing them how this uh, mainstream scientist was faking data and cheating and publishing in a very bad way and making money with the SIGAPS points and stuff like that. So I explained all this. And um, at that time, they told me that if what I say is true, this man will go in jail very fastly. And if he doesn't go to jail, they, will, they won't trust me. And so what happened is that DJ Rold didn't go to jail, was not sanctioned. He could go on spread his disinformation. And that's what led to, to them uh, telling me that uh, I was probably wrong and they could only trust DJ Raoult, which became the god of disinformation. Uh, so during the pandemic, I started fighting against scientific fraud. Not only did you old, I also fought against uh, Bruce Patterson and his, uh, he did a, an excellent work on long COVID to make a lot of money with it. Um, I got numerous verbal threats, physical violence, judicial threats, intimidation. Uh, DJ Raoult is suing me. Uh, and I used social networks to communicate against this situation. Uh, and at that time, I got validated by most major French media, which invited me and gave me an opportunity to talk. So it was pretty interesting because I was switching from the conspiratory tear gas guy to the defending science uh, scientist. Um, I wanted to show you some elements about this disinformation during the pandemic, which I gathered and which I think is very interesting. Uh, first, um, the CCDH, the Center for Controlling Digital Hate, uh, made very interesting documents about disinformation. And they called them the disinformation Dodden, which uh, shows the 12 most active disinformators during the pandemic. Uh, they were actually responsible for 65% of the um, conspiratory content on Facebook. And they also quantified how much money they made even through uh, public aid during the pandemic. Because uh, with lockdowns, uh, there was um, help for companies who could not do their normal business. And so all these disinformators had their businesses, a lot of companies, and they earned a lot of money with public aid for disinformating people. We also have, uh, during the pandemic, um, some agencies, some Russian agencies and also Chinese agencies, which uh, pushed forward, astroturfed, or even created disinformation uh, through various channels. Uh, it's very interesting to, to see how much all these networks also um, kind of silenced all the whistleblowing I was trying to make about this IHU Mediterranean and the hydroxychloroquine studies. So I was kind of living the same thing again, where I was trying to alert about scientific fraud, scientific misconduct, and uh, issues in in publishing about hydroxychloroquine mainly, and how other red herrings, profiteers were having even stronger claims and all the attention was led to the, the stronger claims. Um, I also wanted to, to show you a little reflection about uh, how this disinformation affects uh, freedom of choice. Uh, because, um, of course, facts might lead to one decision. 
and fake news or fake information might lead to another decision. Uh, biases, our own biases will also uh, lead to, to wrong decisions. So both are at stake and will uh, might, might uh, lead us to to the wrong decisions. And so that's one of the main reasons I think it's very important to fight all this disinformation uh, because um, disinformation actors are always instrumentalizing biases we have. Uh, this also has a performance, uh, which I like to show uh, in my presentations. Um, when claims are made top down from government, uh, it can be information or disinformation. Uh, it has one performance. If they are true, the public will have a refusion, will believe and uh, and uh, yeah, support this authority. When the authority is fake, is debunked, you have a diffusion, uh, a top-down diffusion. Well, the same is at stake bottom up when someone not from an official instance is having a claim it can be f true or fake if it's true or considered as true it will trigger diffusion to the authority if it's fake it will create refusion to this authority so for me it's very important that the authorities have a very honest way to talk and uh, debunking has a performance. And here is uh, something I was confronted with. Um, the fact that I was um, working on tear gas, I was in a bottom-up situation. And when I was considered as debunked at the in the first period of time, it was actually creating a review, and I was kind of feeling it because people were... Uh, supporting the president and telling me that uh, I was an activist, I was uh, just doing um, stupid things. When some authorities like scientists and media changed their mind and uh, looked at what I was showing more precisely and said, maybe there's some public health issues with this tear gas, um, it created some diffusion among the same people. So I think um, the performance of the topics we select and the things we work on should be chosen knowing this, knowing that it has consequences on the trust to authorities. Uh, it's something we often forget to, to think of when we work on, on debunking or checking claims. And one of the major issues is that uh, a journal working on debunking uh, has a limited time and effort and usually chooses what is easy to debunk and what is the most easy to debunk is the most stupid claim uh, about the government or something very weird. And so usually it's top-down debunking, which is done by, by most medias. Bottom-up debunking takes a lot of time, as you could see it, uh, or checking the information, not not only debunking, but che fact-checking, let's say. Um, when it goes to tear gas, you have to ask a lot of scientists. You have to know what what I did exactly. What is this measurement? To read literature. To so it's a it's a very longer work. It's way more difficult to check if uh, I I was saying wrong things about tear gas than to check if someone who claimed that um, President Macron is hiding neurotoxic agents in tear gas. So, yeah, I think uh, the performance of what we debunk has also consequences. Um, finally, I think that the pandemic, but also the other elements I showed you, had a very, uh, on the protesters, had a very strong effect on trust in science. Um, and I would recommend this publication, uh, which showed that, uh, well, Trust in scientists went down during the pandemic, and we have to recreate trust in this authority again. It's a very important cause to me by having clear information. Uh, here are some hints or some ideas I think of uh, to improve public health whistleblowing. Uh, to me, the first part is having good scientific integrity, using open science, 
or making data available to anyone, education, and media integrity. I think those four elements are central. Uh, and um, I think it's important to, to reduce the effect of disinformation to help whistleblowers, actually. True whistleblowers are harmed by, by all the red herrings around. So I think fighting disinformation helps whistleblowing. And uh, here are some tools I found on, on a platform, which is uh, the RAND platform, which gives you... So, so here are the topics, the main topics they are working on uh, to fight disinformation and to help better information come through. Uh, I think they, they, are, they are collecting different tools and updating them. And uh, I think it's a very, very good website to, to go to, to do some, uh, to, to collect some tools and use them on a daily basis. So this was the whole presentation I wanted to give about my work on tear gas. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. And I want to thank some physicians uh, who worked with me, Josiane Clépier, Christian Blondin, and two who sadly died. Uh, Renaud Fievé and René Guirette. Uh, Tom David, who worked with me on sociological aspects of this work. Uh, Jais Adam Troyan, who is uh, who I met because he was doing some prospective study on the psychological effects of uh, police brutality. And it's very interesting because he, by doing this, he, he had questions which I was also asking about tear gas effects because um, it's kind of the same symptoms when you have PTSD and when you have uh, cyanide exposure days after. Uh, and um, some cyanide exposures in, are also mistaken for um, panic attacks. So uh, it was very interesting to try to find, we're still trying to find a way to distinguish between um, psychological effects and physiological effects of cyanide on protesters. And I think it's important when you both have different ideas to get in common and try to find a way to, to, to address this question and try to distinguish both. And so we, are, we had some, some ideas, but sadly during the pandemic, all the psychological markers went up. So we couldn't really do the study we wanted to do, but I think we can maybe start it again after a while, when when protests start, I, I have some protests again against reforms in France. So I think it could be an opportunity to to check it again. I wanted to thank all the small hands, uh, which helped me also during the this whistleblowing. Uh, they are not scientists; they are sometimes yellow vests, but they were very interested in the work I did, and uh, they decided to to alert me to to do some media watching and to to inform me when publications came out and they even looked at public I, I told them how to look at public scientific publications to to watch to get alerts and stuff and so they they always told me what what comes out the newest things about tear gas and everything so it was very interesting to have uh, people who are not scientists from a scientific background helping you and uh here are some I like recommending a lot of books, but uh, 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 here are some books covering all the topics I was talking about here. Uh, I've, I'm not cheating. I've read all of them. They are very, all very. From, yeah, like you have, you have a benefit from your going on there. But your topic, but you validate them, and that makes a long-term harm. What was your decision process? That's a very good question because it's exactly the strategy. 
RTG, which is used by Russian disinformation channels. Um, I'm, I think you, you make a point. I'm not quite sure if I, I have no indicator to tell you, yes, what I'm doing is the right thing. But I think... Um, it's just good to... If there are other questions, I think there are. Can you? Can you? Ah, yes, yeah. there's one. And 2019, 2020. It's a great example of the information. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not a clear distinction between what is fake news, what is um, just disinformation. Uh, and but in in the meantime, the, the there was a pandemic, and maybe the journalists. And try to to cover uh, scientific research and medical research with maybe a bit more of caution. Would you say? Um, um, what's your opinion on this? Has the situation slightly improved, maybe, uh, on this topic? Is are there reasons to be to be optimistic? Maybe? Yeah, it's a it's a good question again. So again, it's not something I can quantify. It's something I can, but I have some elements, some quantitative elements. Uh, there was a pure research paper. Uh, I don't have it right here, which showed that fact checking, were even not media fact checking, but also uh, just random fact checkers, raised a lot during the pandemic. There are way more fact checkers, so I think this increased, and that's very positive. But yeah, I think uh, media made a big mistake at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, giving um, a lot of attention to fake whistleblowers to to fake things and they learned a lot i i can see that um when i, I talk to a lot of, of journalists now because they, they follow me and when they address me they are they, they tell me they made mistakes they know they made mistakes um i think uh what could be done to be optimistic if it's always interesting to give clues or to give ideas i think what could be done is to add uh scientific integrity uh specialists to uh to uh, mainstream media to big media because when i look at what happens in europe you have a big uh tv channel which is called arte which is a french german project which is considered by a general population as something very serious and very scientific uh they made recently an anti-vax uh documentary called the vaccine is which i'm debunking uh, which is even worse than to me than what conspiracy theorists made because it's it has some kind of credibility inside, but it was made by the daughter of a leader of an anti-vax movement. It was uh, helped by um, the Paris region, so it got money from Paris region, and it got money from Arte. And so, I'm not quite sure the lesson was really learned. Mm -hmm. And I think we need more than just saying uh, they learned something from the pandemic. I think that we need to to create new structures. We need to have uh, more scientific journalists. That's something that we are lacking uh, because um, a scientific journalist is someone with a scientific background. He can evaluate science. And we need uh, a scientific proofreading of the documentaries that come out from the media. Okay. But I'm open to discussions. If you have other ideas, I'm very curious about what you think. Yeah, because uh, I think there are many other examples where when we try to raise attention about a topic uh, in traditional media, it yeah, it results in yeah what you call flow alerts. The, the the message is not completely understood, or it's influenced by other sources that are 
maybe in, yeah influenced by other other goals and yeah i suppose we try to 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 find solutions uh, uh, on on the tensor platform but is it uh, <laughs> is it the best approach we, we don't really know <laughs> Yeah, I, I like the what you're doing is something very, very interesting with the Turnosol talks because I think it's it's well, the Turnosol in general, the the app and everything. I think it's it's one of the the ways to do it. And it doesn't come from the media actually; it comes from from you. Uh, and and yeah, I think the, this is the kind of things we need actually, and to to help people distinguish what is fake and what is true. Uh, we have media education, of course, which is important. Uh, but we, I think there's one thing most people believe that um, uh, people don't really know how to check an information. Uh, I don't believe it's true. I think most people are too lazy to do it. And we have lots of studies showing that there's uh, social media fatigue, which is calling, which is causing uh, less verification, less information verification. We have a lot of elements that uh, make us lazy on a daily basis. I mean, even myself, uh, when I read something in a newspaper, I don't always feel like checking the whole information again and uh, taking a whole hour to read a small article. I prefer reading the article and taking it for granted and going forward. It depends on the importance of the subject. And so I think it's a, also a matter of investment of time. People want to to use on an information. They could check it. They could find it's flawed or it's fake or it's true, but they don't do it because they don't want to spend an hour on it. And having something like an app telling you uh, if it's uh, an app you consider you trust, like NewsGuard or stuff like that, uh, is a tool that can be helpful for people who trust this tool, but this tool has to be trustworthy. Okay, thank you very much. Anyway, so that if I have a question, maybe first it's uh, very interesting to have your take on on Tornesol, but like on the traditional media, since you really experienced very different ones, it seems uh, like, could you tell us which ones you would have sort of believed the most now that you you have seen what really the journalists uh, are doing, the, the kind of problems there is in the profession and the kind of things they are trying to change? Like, what are the ones that are the most trustworthy for you, like that we can believe in? Well, I, I changed from media to journalists. I'm now uh, thinking of um, sometimes a journalist is making very good work, spending a lot of time on it. Uh, the media is not really censoring much. They are publishing what the journalist does. And they have a pretty broad latitude. And so on the same media, you can find a very good journalist doing very good work and poor quality work. Uh, it depends on who you're working with. And so um, I will not evade the question. I will tell you the media I, I trust most. Uh, I can only say French media because uh, even if we're talking English, I, I didn't have contact to international media much. I only had the New York Times and so some outlets in South America and stuff. In France, I trust most Czech news from Liberation, uh, which is doing a very good fact checking. I like fact checkers in general. Uh, the AFP fact checking and the Le Monde fact checking. Um, I'm, yeah, I think Liberation is one of the media's that were the the best ones uh, in my eyes, which investigated most and used uh, most of the time on it. Uh, surprisingly, the Figaro did a pretty good work to me. Um, I didn't like the Figaro much before, but I have to say uh, the journalist from the Figaro did a, a good work with me. So I was pretty happy of it. Um, and uh, Le Monde is uh, something I was trusting before. I liked the coverage of the pandemic. There were some articles which were very interesting. I distrust um, some of their work 
uh, especially related to Foucault. Uh, sadly, because I'm I'm not convinced of his work and his approach, especially about GMOs. Um, I also would say, yeah, I think there's another media I forgot to mention. I'm thinking. Uh, I don't remind, but I, I will tell you later if I find another one. But uh, I know there was another media I wanted to say. Um, and in South America, the interference the journalists were very good. I like their work. And the journalists, I, uh, yeah, now I know which media I was forgetting. L'Express was very good during the pandemic. Um, I interacted with some L'Express journalists and they did a pretty tough work. Okay, thank you. And in the like, uh more independent media like uh, did you have the chance to work with some journalists there and did you notice any like diff major difference like uh, in their yes approach? uh well independent media is pretty interesting they are often passionate they are very interested uh they are not true journalists so often they put more energy in things trying to be good journalists and so they don't have the the right clues, but they have the time. They, they take the time to do it. That's pretty interesting. Um, I would mention uh, one media called La Mule du Pape, which nobody would know, very small one, very underground one, who are doing very strong investigations and very good work. Um, I like what they do, their, their approach. Um, Info du jour is pretty good too. They're working on... Uh, Sects and uh, all the um, gurus and all this stuff, cons yeah, all the dangerous things I'm trying to fight also. Uh, and um, yeah, there are, s it's difficult to say it's varied. Uh, for instance, uh, you have Blast magazine, which I liked before, which invited some disinformation some disinformation in, in their pages. Um, as an engaged person, I like very much the work done by Street Press, which is, I, I'll be honest, it's a very left-wing uh, outlet, uh, which is oriented against police brutality and stuff. But they work on, they do some open source uh, research and stuff like that. So it's pretty interesting because what they claim is pretty strong usually. And I also enjoy NGOs related medias. Uh, Disclose is very interesting. Uh, they have a very scientific approach on their, what they bring out. And uh, I was working with one NGO I told you about Index. They were considering transforming their work into being a media. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Any other question? So, so maybe one. I mean, I, I'm. I mean, it's quite uh, impressive and important what you have done in all this work. And if I understand correctly, you you started essentially from the fact that you had, uh, like, let's say, scientific competence to know about like the biochemistry aspects of what's what i mean the beginning very was was really into like uh if i understand understanding these papers and and following the situation but your own competence were probably very important to start with uh and then it seems that uh it changed a bit because then you you i mean at least in the presentation you focused on many different uh, other aspects like medical or interacting with many different people um and so for you, how much was it important to have this scientific background uh, for this special case that you treated? Yes, uh, again, good question. I'm, I'm often wondering because I'm trying to fight this authority bias. Um, I don't want to be myself an authority in a field. I, I just want to the science and the claims to be discussed and just to check the data. And um, I, I showed in the acknowledgments that uh, I thanked Julien Chez, for instance, who is uh, selling fishes in uh, Carrefour super supermarket. So <laughs> he's not a scientist, but he was uh, one of the first ones talking about cyanide uh, because of tear gas. 
And what was interesting is he tried to read scientific papers. He didn't get everything right, but he made a pretty impressive work for someone who never read a scientific paper. It was very interesting to see how his approach. And so I think I'm, I'm trying to be very modest and not to say that um, you have to be someone who knows everything from a field to be good at it. My background helped me, of course, in what was related to biochemistry. But quickly, I had to go in fields I had never looked at before. Toxicology is not something I master, actually. And um, I think mainly what my background was useful for was that I was able to read scientific papers. I learned how to read them during my PhD. And I was also able to find scientific misconduct, which I was very interested in. And those parts helped me a lot. When I think uh, someone who is passionate about something can gain competence and uh, his attitude is very important when you are open to being wrong i'm still open I, I think it's the most important thing all i showed you here is just my work from someone who is a high school teacher but i got passionate in this topic and i spent day and night reading papers about tear gas i read as i told you more than i read for my phd so I know a lot of things. I can send you the publications. But maybe I got something wrong. Maybe I didn't know everything. Maybe someone will, with a lab or who can do it will check cyanide levels in blood after, after tear gas exposure and will prove me I'm wrong and show me that it's, it's not that much. I'm open to it. And I would be very happy if it was done because it, I, I would be satisfied. I would say, okay, now I know. Um, and I think this is the, the most important thing. The attitude is more important than uh, the, the the authority you have, the capacities you have, and the strength of your claim. Um, I think if you don't know much, you're not a scientist, but you start reading about a topic, you find things, and you believe you're right. You can be wrong anyways. You, you have a claim. It can be very strong. It, it can be stronger than a specialist, because a specialist often is specialist. I interacted with toxicologists. They know all the poisonings around i know nothing about fungus poisoning i know nothing about all the molecules you can get poisoned with i don't have uh, their knowledge but when it goes on tear gas they know almost nothing and i'm impressed by the fact that i'm very simple things that are the first elements of the literature they don't even know the basics and it's normal because they don't have time to read everything about every single molecule. So I think it's not the case of any toxicologist, but most toxicologists I've talked with have to read papers before knowing something about tear gas. And so I think it's uh, important not to claim you are a specialist about something that you know everything. It's not because you are a toxicologist that anything about toxicology is uh, mastered by you. Uh, you have to be open. Someone who <laughs> comes from nowhere who knows not much, but who has read a lot of papers in one field on one topic, can know a lot of things. I can bring you some very interesting impulse. But uh, his attitude is also very important. If he's close-minded and he just wants to say tear gas is dangerous and will kill people, then you can discuss with him. You can't. It can't bring anything interesting. So the attitude of someone who is not an authority, who is not a big scientist, is also important. Uh, to, to get to to elevate the scientific knowledge. And so in my view, it was not that important to answer your question precisely. It was not that important. My background was not the main thing I needed. Uh, it's just time I spent on it, which made me know all the things. Yeah, I understand. Any other uh yeah. Do, do you know if uh, now that she's been uh, recognized and you've published your uh, piece of paper uh, with the, um, I don't remember his name, but the, the head. Andre Pico, the, yes. Yes. Do you know if there are some uh, some new studies conducted now or clinical trials or blood samplings? And Nothing of my knowledge. The only thing I found, I'm, I'm always looking on PubMed if anything new comes out on tear gas. There were two publications, meanwhile. Uh, one uh, interested in environment pollution. About, they found a way to quantify malononitrile in the environment because this molecule is also by thermal dispersion degraded and they were worrying about pollution after tear gas in, in general. It's a South Korean study. So in, it was very just a, 
It's very technical. They published about how to quantify malonyl nitrile actually. Um, and another one, which was mainly a review, uh, we have a lot of reviews like that, um, claiming that uh, tear gas is very dangerous for public health and shouldn't be used that much. So we have a lot of papers which review the literature which, and say it's dangerous and we shouldn't use it. Um, the scientific community is actually pretty, you know, there's a consensus on saying we shouldn't use it. But it's easy to say it when you're not a police officer. I mean, if I were in charge of uh, uh, fighting a riot, I don't know if I would say it's so dangerous. Maybe it's less dangerous than my my weapon, my my fire weapon, my firearms. And so um, there's on sociology a very interesting work by Paul Rocher, who asked this question: Is it uh, uh, is actually uh, using tear gas, reducing the use of firearms. And in his data, he hasn't much data, but he showed that uh, before and after introduction of tear gas, the number of firearm shots didn't get reduced. It increased, actually. So it's like when you're... Um, for It's for violence, a bit like what we can say for smoke and vaping. Uh, vaping is a way to stop smoking because it's, uh, it's a product that can be used to reduce your cigarette consumption, but it's also a way to enter into cigarette consumption. It's a way to start smoking. And so tear gas, uh, I think, can be considered a bit the same way. It's a way to reduce violence, of course, because it's not as violent as firearms or something like that. But it's also a way to enter into violence where violence is not needed. And so um, from the data, it shows that uh, it's more an entry product than an exit product. So maybe if there are not other questions, uh, I can stop recording. But for the ones that want to to stay, we can possibly continue a bit the discussion. It depends on you, Alex, of course. Yeah, I'm available. <laughs>